Hello everyone and welcome back to the Jacksonville Jaguars franchise. This is the edited offseason of the stream I did on Saturday last week, going through the entire Season 2 offseason, getting us ready for Season 3. So if you would like to watch the three hours of streaming, I have links in the description to Parts 1 and 2. Part 2 is just the draft if you just want to watch that and that's a little over an hour. Otherwise, free agency and stuff took quite a while, much longer than I expected. And I'm not going to be talking about Season 2 very much in this video or recapping stats. So if you want to watch the recap video, that's also on my channel. But today we are recapping everything I did here in the offseason. And we start by looking at who made the Pro Bowl for us. We saw that Julius Thomas made it as tight end number one. And as we go down the list here, defensive ends, we see Dante Fowler was our second Pro Bowl selection. Now, as we saw in the recap video and in the end of week 17, we know Nate Bell was the defensive rookie of the year. But as we go down to cornerbacks, he is not on the list. Nate Bell was not named one of the top eight cornerbacks after his eight interception defensive rookie of the year campaign. I'm sure he wasn't far behind, but I did expect him to make it to the Pro Bowl and have that extra XP built up. So we ended up with only two Pro Bowlers after our 9-7 season, Julius Thomas and Dante Fowler. Now we're going through the playoff results. We see our division rivals, the Tennessee Titans, who won the South. They beat the Kansas City Chiefs by one and then lost by one to the San Diego Chargers. In the title games, we had the Chargers beating the Jets and the Seahawks beating the Cowboys. Each game was decided by three points. Now, as we sim ahead to the offseason, we see a lot of retirements. Adrian Peterson, Larry Fitzgerald, as well as a Super Bowl victory going to the San Diego Chargers. They are the champions heading into Season 3. But the retirements weren't done there. Anquan Bolden, Eli Manning, Roddy White, Heath Miller, Greg Jennings, and there were others. And then, at the same time, you have players getting tagged. You have teams making big deals with their expiring free agents. And there were some that I had written down and trying to plan out ways to get them. And here was one of them, Tyran Matthew. He got franchise tag. I kind of expected that. The safety tag is very cheap. Big contracts went out to players like Keenan Allen. We see George Iloka was tagged. Safety was a big priority of mine, as was cornerback. And here was my live reaction during the stream. You re-signed every time. No! That's my top target! My top target was going to be Xavier Rhodes. In a press man heavy scheme, I thought that Xavier Rhodes would be the ultimate free agent pickup for us to go for. I was willing to give him whatever he wanted. I would have paid that contract that Minnesota gave him. I wanted to pair him up with Nate Bell. But that's not going to happen. Instead, now we focus on our free agents, and we had some big ones here at the top, including left tackle Luke Jokel, who wants a $30 million deal over five years. I offered him five years, $32 million. That was my first offer of free agency, and he accepted. There was a big re-signing for us. Now, we had Rolando McClain on a one-year contract last year. He kind of reset his market and now he wants a $33 million contract. It offered him $35 million, and he accepted. Those were the big two free agents. We already had some holes on the roster, and I didn't want to have to create any more. But we're not done there. 16 more free agents. I decided Mercedes Lewis was not a scheme fit for what I want to do moving forward, so I ended negotiations. Then Jonathan Cyprian. I was very interested in having him play more of an outside linebacker role. He has the traits that convert, and he can play kind of a Deion Buchanan type of role, but he did not like the contract offer I gave him, so he's going to test. Fullback Jameez Olawale was a nice addition for us last year. He has some running ability, receiving ability, and is a good blocker. He accepted the contract that I offered him. Here is Demetrius McCray wanting a $14.3 million contract. I was interested in keeping him for a short-term cheap deal. He's big, he's physical, but he's not really a starter caliber player. He didn't like the offer I gave him, however. Next up was Brandon Boykin. He wants over $5 million a season, and he's a very good slot corner. He was reliable for us last year, but I really didn't want to hand out that big of a contract. Next up, Alan Hearns. He didn't want a lot of money, 
and I didn't think that he impressed enough as a starting receiver, and certainly down the stretch, he wasn't as impressive. I offered him a $7 million contract, and he accepted. Next was Charles Johnson. I gave him a one-year offer, and he declined. Dwayne Gratz is up next, wanting over $4 million a season. Again, I was interested in perhaps bringing him back, but not at that number. Gratz, McCray, and Boykin will all test, and I still had interest in all three of them. Here is Case Keenum. I wanted to keep him around as QB3, but he did not like the offer I gave him, so he's going to test. Denard Robinson wanted a one-year deal, but I offered a two-year contract, and he accepted. So here's a look at all the contract accepts and declines so far. We still have a few more players to go through. I was not all that impressed with Dominic Easley, so I ended negotiations right there. Spencer Paysinger, I thought, did an okay job in the place of Telvin Smith. He's a backup caliber player, and that's what I wanted to sign him for, and he accepted that two-year contract. Here is Brian Anger, and I don't think he has played well enough to earn a high punter contract. So I gave him the franchise tag, but had plans to bring in competition in preseason. Here are the signings I made and the numbers to go along with them. The big deals were just the Jokel and McLean signing, but we still have plenty of cap room. I had a lot of money to spend, but a lot of my top targets were already re-signed by their prior teams. So we still had holes at wide receiver. I wanted to get more dynamic, bring in some speed. I wanted to bring in another cornerback. I wanted some free safety help, and I wanted a backup tight end. So, we go through the list of players. Here are the receivers. Alshon Jeffrey at the top, but Emmanuel Sanders is closer to what I wanted and isn't as expensive. Now, he's 30 years old, but still has the speed and route running ability that I was looking for. I want a starting receiver with those traits who can get some yards after the catch, offer a speed element we've been missing the first two years in this series, so I offered him a contract. Next up, Vance McDonald. We could use a third and perhaps fourth tight end, Perhaps with more twin tight end looks next year, we definitely need to have a quality backup tight end. So I offered to McDonald. I thought about Cordero Patterson. He has speed and great elusiveness, but his receiver skills have not developed. We are not in the position to go after a receiver like him. Sean Smith was my second cornerback on my list I wanted, but he's four years older than Xavier Rhodes. He has 86 speed, 97 press, man coverage ability, but he wants a lot of money, and he's not young. So I wanted to give him like a two-year contract. I didn't want this to have a one-year stopgap fix, but I then got to see how expensive this was going to be. The Falcons were bidding. The Raiders were already ahead of us. I was looking at putting this up towards like $15 million a season, which we can afford over two years, but it's not a long-term solution. So that kind of had me debating that back and forth, and I think Sean Smith may have dragged out this offseason at least an extra 15, 20 minutes. At free safety, Eric Reed and Reggie Nelson were options. Nelson is a veteran who was originally drafted by the Jaguars. He fits the type of safety I want, which is more of a cover one safety that has to cover a lot of ground. So I offered him a contract. Here is Dakota Watson, a speedy linebacker with good size and some coverage ability. You guys know the mold of linebackers that I like, so bringing in Watson is kind of a no-brainer. I had to put an offer out there for the 29-year-old. And then we advance to the next stage and see how these first offers went. And Vance McDonald accepted his offer. So that's one check mark, but still the big ones remain. And in the Sean Smith sweepstakes, the Texans put their hat in the ring. And I did not want to see Sean Smith and a player of his caliber go to a division rival. So that really made me want to up my offer. And that's immediately what I did. I put in a two-year offer. 27.5 million dollars that did make us the highest bidder but this was something i kept going back and forth on i then decided to make a one-year offer because that's what he wants and i tried to fit his needs so he wouldn't go to houston but i kept on debating sean smith and ultimately i decided that he's 30 years old we have some good draft picks i don't want to spend the capital right now i rather just hang on to it and have some younger guys try to take over that right cornerback spot. So I declined. I withdrew my offer for Sean Smith and hope the Texans did not end up with him. I went back to Brandon Boykin now, trying to get him for cheaper than his initial demand. This offer is in the neighborhood of three years, $14 million. I thought about Janoris Jenkins, but I decided that I'd rather wait for the draft than offer him a contract. 
One player who caught my attention was outside linebacker Brandon Graham, and I was interested because we could strengthen our pass rush and have another rotational option, keep guys fresh, and continue building up this defense. I was willing to give him a two-year offer. He's 29 years old, and I saw that the Colts were interested, so I wanted to pry him away after uh, going away from the Sean Smith idea. I offered eventually like a two-year, $10 million contract, and then we moved on to Tavon Austin. If you want to get dynamic, here's a guy you have to at least consider. Austin has great speed, great agility, hasn't developed enough as a wide receiver, but there are ways you can use him and best use his abilities, and our offense could use a player like him. Now, while I debated all of these free agents, the combine numbers came out for the draft prospects. I had the Bears' first-round pick along with ours down in the lower teens, even with signing Sanders, I was still very interested in Keiston Holiday, who ran a 4-3-5. He has good hands, B-minus release. I was very, very interested. Julius Blake was another that caught my attention. He's a smaller receiver with great hands, but his speed wasn't as high, and he was more agility-based. Vladimir Mims, a late-round prospect at 6'4", with great hands that can make the tough catches, and had the second-best vertical jump. He really caught my attention. Offensive line was still a problem. I wanted to look at a tackle. And at cornerback and safety, here is Josh Buchanan. He had a fantastic combine. He's been the highest rated corner, and he's right there at the top with our first pick from the Bears. Deontay King was another I was very interested in. B-plus press, B-plus man at 5'10". I was looking for a guy who could play outside across from Nate Bell. Here's Gordon Solomon. He had the best 40 at 4'3", and he's well-rounded at 6 feet tall. Colin Chrisholm here, an outside linebacker. This wasn't maybe a high priority for us, but it's something we have to think about with Paul Puzlesny's age and likely moving Rolando McLean back inside at some point. Julius Bennett was one I hoped had a better combine. There were draft stories about him, but I thought that Chrisholm was much more impressive of an athlete. Stefan Lockett, inside linebacker in the second round, probably not in a good spot for us, but I liked his talent a lot. I really wanted to get a right tackle this offseason, and Seth Griffin was my favorite right tackle. He had a pretty good combine. Harris Rock, a left end who could play defensive tackle with A-minus block shedding. I was very, very high on him. We go ahead now to the next stage, and at this point, we had only signed one player. It was still just Vance McDonald. We had the highest bid for Emmanuel Sanders. The Cardinals were outbidding us for Brandon Graham. Reggie Nelson, we were the only team interested in him. The Dolphins had a higher bid for Brandon Boykin. And the Bills were challenging us for Tavon Austin. I had some interest in Joseph Fourier, but I ended up withdrawing that offer. I went back to Brandon Boykin and upped the offer as Miami was trying to get him. I know how valuable he is. We were familiar with him. He had a very good year with us, but Miami still had the highest bid. Then I went to Tavon Austin, upped it to around three years, $8 million. We became the highest bidder. With Brandon Boykin being potentially pretty expensive, I was looking then at Kawan Williams, who was just a little bit lower in terms of ratings, but still very good in the nickel. Then we go back to the corners who were previously on our roster, Demetrius McCray, two years, $6 million. I gave him that offer and then gave Dwayne Gratz a slightly smaller offer, but I was still interested in having those guys on the roster. I was also interested in Jonathan Cyprian, but the Texans had already signed him for four years. So perhaps we're going to see Cyprian twice a year. Here is the look at some of the other signings that went on. Alshon Jeffrey gets big money to go to Washington, but otherwise there weren't a lot of high-rated players getting signed at this point. Sharif Floyd was kind of the prize of free agency at 97 overall. I really wanted to get a starting tackle in either free agency or the draft, but I didn't like a lot of these tackle options, and I didn't want to spend too much money. I was interested in a short-term offer, but I didn't offer any tackles. So that's the end of free agency, and we did end up signing Emmanuel Sanders. That was a big move for us. He's a receiver that fits the profile of exactly what I was looking for outside of being a 30-year-old player. Tavon Austin accepted, Dakota Watson, Brandon Boykin declined along with Dwayne Gratz. We ended up signing Demetrius McRae and Reggie Nelson and could not get Brandon Graham. Here are some of the signings throughout the league as Graham got three years, $16.5 million. Dwayne Grass declined and went to Chicago on a four-year, $12 million contract. 
I mentioned interest in Kawan Williams, but he went to Oakland for four years, $24.9 million. And Sharif Floyd went to New England on a five-year, $55 million contract. Matt Barkley got a four-year offer to replace Eli Manning for the Giants. Vincent Jackson gets $10 million a year to go to Chicago. And we see Tyrod Taylor is going to Washington on a four-year contract. Rashad Jones, nearly $10 million a year to go to Denver. Drew Brees signs a one-year offer with the Philadelphia Eagles. The Saints do bring in Terrence Williams. The Bears ended up signing Sean Smith one year, $15.1 million. And the Saints, they get Brandon Whedon to strengthen the quarterback position after the departure of Drew Brees. Brandon Boykin ended up getting four years, $31.1 million, by the way, so around what I gave Jokel and Rolando McClain. That is it for free agency, and now we'll recap the draft. We had two first-round picks and some issues at right tackle and right cornerback. We had pick number five, thanks to the Chicago Bears, who traded up last year to get their quarterback. And the 49ers take a quarterback here at number one overall. That's Dustin Barr, who is in the stories with a very good pro day performance. The Bills then take a left end, and the Steelers take a left tackle at number three. Our division rivals ahead of us, the Houston Texans, at number four overall, end up selecting another tackle. That's Herrick. Those weren't the tackles I had my eyes on, but here at number five, I didn't think tackle was the best value. I considered options for trading down. There were some future picks being offered, but I wasn't as interested in those future offers this high in the draft. Washington and Oakland were each willing to give up their second round picks to trade up but I didn't want to drop down to the teens, either 13 or 16. As we look at the board, we see Josh Buchanan is one of the best players available. We know he has very good zone coverage and press, and he was a tremendous athlete and tore up the combine. So I decided to select Josh Buchanan at number 5, and it was billed as a reach. He was 27 in true talent, 92 speed, good man coverage, good zone, good press. We had big needs in the secondary. Free safety was still a question, right cornerback, slot cornerback, so I had to bring in the most talented corner I thought there was. The value was there, and he was the best player I thought to take at number five. We then picked later in the first round in the teens, so it wasn't long between our first and second picks. As you see, Pone Krisholm go off the board to New York. I don't think that linebacker would have been a wise move in the first round regardless. Pone Blake goes, Jerron Mack goes. You can see these corners were off the board. I didn't want to trade down and miss out on Josh Buchanan. Here are the Colts at number 14, and they end up selecting Kevin Chrisholm, the outside linebacker. We're getting very close to our pick now. But one of my favorite players went off the board. Seth Griffin went to Oakland. I really wanted to get a right tackle, and there weren't a lot of quality ones I liked. And then Detroit took a left tackle. And Baltimore took the left tackle I really liked. So there goes my favorite early round tackle options. We now had to go to the plan B. And when you consider value here, I wasn't even looking at these tackles any longer. I scouted them, didn't think the value was here. I wasn't even sure they would be starting caliber. I try to keep the BPA mentality in my mind, but I have to factor in need as well. These linebackers were not as impressive as Pone Chrisholm, who went number 8 to New York. I thought about trading down, but the offers for this year's picks were just too low. There was the Cowboys at 29 and Seattle at 31. That was way too far for me to drop. So instead, I took a player I thought was very valuable and selected wide receiver Keiston Holiday, and this was also billed as a reach. 63 in true talent. That is almost a third rounder. But he is the type of player I was looking for, and with Allen Robinson and Marquise Lee entering contract years, I couldn't just get one wide receiver. Holiday was one of my favorite players, and I made sure to get him. So the first two picks were in the first round, and both called reaches. But keep in mind that Buchanan was rated the top corner, and Holiday the third receiver, so I was very worried about those players getting taken before I had a chance. With my next selections, I definitely wanted to have better value, and I wanted to make sure that we could still fill our needs. So I thought about trading up. Julius Bennett went to the Bengals. I didn't think he was worth trading up for. And then Gabe Jeffrey went to Seattle. Same situation. These linebackers were not as good as Chris Holm. And we see that the Colts traded up to get Basmine Caldwell a free safety. In the second round, I thought the best value was going to be another defensive back. 
I didn't think there were any good tackles or linebackers at this spot, and I'd already drafted a receiver. So I tried trading up. I offered a four to trade up with the Steelers and go up 14 spots. But that wasn't enough value for them, and they took Deontay King, who was my second favorite cornerback. Great man coverage and press ability. He was actually my number one corner before the combine, and I saw how well Buchanan did. Then I ended up trading up with the Bills. I gave him a later four and a seven, and here I wanted to take another defensive back. We did this last year, and we're doing it again in season two. Gordon Solomon was my third selection. He was number 25 in true talent. He's at six foot, 97 speed. He has good coverage ratings. They need to get up a little bit. 84 press. There's a lot to work with here. He's a great athlete. And what I'm hoping for is that he can compete to be the right cornerback opposite of Nate Bell. So two corners and a receiver as we see Harris Rock went to the Chicago Bears. Stephon Lockett went to the Kansas City Chiefs, who's my favorite linebacker available. Van Bernard went to the Seahawks. I liked him. He was one of my only tackles I liked left. Then we see that the Texans took Edwards, a defensive tackle I was very interested in, just not here in the second round. The Lions took big receiver Dre Burnett, and here we are now at number 83 for another selection. Now, here was the watch list at this point, and it's a lot of fourth rounders, and then we dip into the fifth rounders. So, I was interested here in trading down, and I did so with the Dallas Cowboys and recouped a fifth round selection. I dropped down 10 spots, and the players I wanted did not go off the board. So, here... In the third round, at number 29, I selected Antoine Dunn, and this appeared to be a very good pick. Now, my plan was to move him to defensive tackle at 6'9", 299, with good power moves, good tackling, and block shedding. I was very interested in his value here in the middle of the draft. I took talent over need, as Mason, the right tackle, went to the Chargers. If I was need-based drafting, I would have taken Mason, so instead we end up with Antoine Dunn. Now in the fourth round, I was looking at what else I had on the board, and Vladimir Mims was a target I was very interested in, but Ryan Matthew was rated a little bit higher. I was worried about him going off the board, and I selected him. It was another good value pick. It wasn't a very popular pick in the live chat, but he has very good strength, and he has good impact blocking, so it's a lineman to develop. And then at 109, I just didn't think that there were value players here, and I wanted to trade down and get a future third-round pick. This is where I'll consider trading for the future. So we trade with the Browns, and they end up taking back-to-back -back corners. We'll see if they hit on one of those guys. But they took two shots at it. Can't fault them for trying. The players I liked a lot at this point of the draft were like 6th and 7th round prospects. I wanted to get some later picks and trade down, but there weren't a lot of good options for that. So I had to get the future third, which is a great idea at this point of the draft. But then we had to go all the way to the 5th round for our next selection, and the players I'd interest in were still here. And here was a big one, literally. 6'4 receiver from LSU, Vladimir Mims was my pick in the 5th round. He was a very good value at this point, 89 speed, 98 jumping, 87 spectacular catch. Now his route running isn't good, and his awareness isn't very good, but I think for the role he's going to play, which is either a downfield or red zone threat, I think he fits that very well for us. Later in the 5th round, I had another pick from that trade down with the Dallas Cowboys and here I selected seventh round prospect Angel Scott it's another good value pick for us I've wanted to get another good run stopping lineman and I think I found one here in Angel Scott now I wanted to get a couple more picks if I could I tried some trade downs I wanted to trade my six for a six and a seven and teams just were not interested so I had to make my final pick here in the sixth round and I hadn't addressed tackle yet, so I selected Trey Wade from Maine. Again, this was good value. He had 86 run block, 82 strength, 82 pass block, 80 impact blocking. So likely not a starter caliber player, but at least quality depth. And he replaces Josh Wells, who walked in free agency. So those were the selections for me in this draft. I'd love to know your guys' thoughts on how this offseason went down below in the comment section. We again took two corners very early. Back-to-back -back years, I had to first and foremost address that. 
We took Keiston Holiday also in the first round. Antoine Dunn in the third. Ryan Matthew in the fourth. Vladimir Mims and Angel Scott in the fifth. And Trey Wade in the sixth. Now, our division rivals made some interesting picks, and here were the Texans with a good left tackle and defensive tackle selection. The Titans didn't have as strong of a draft class as it appears right now. They did get a quality tight end, but they lost Delaney Walker in free agency, so it's a net loss regardless. But here are the Colts, and look at the value they attained throughout this class. They did a pretty good job early on, but in the middle, those two defensive tackles... That is unbelievable, and I'm worried about this team heading forward. They were a six-win team last year, and defense has been their weakness, and they really addressed it this offseason, and we'll see how much improved they are in Season 3. After this, I had to make some undrafted signings and whatnot, but first I had to move some players to new positions. Tavon Austin was moved to running back, which allows him to play both running back and receiver. Antoine Dunn to defensive tackle. Zane Beatles will compete with Jeremy Parnell at right tackle, and Beatles actually played some tackle in college. Ryan Cole will compete at guard, and Angel Scott was moved to left end. Here are the undrafted and veteran signings I made ahead of preseason, and I changed my mind on a couple of them. But Sam Bradford is the new QB3. We'll see how he performs. His skills have gone down a bit. Here are some undrafted players that I think could provide some impact in the preseason. Rennell Curse is a rookie running back who is going to compete with Rashad Marshall. I said I would do this. I brought in another power back, and we'll see which one performs the best. Here is strong safety Bill Kelly. He has good speed and hitting power, but is he going to be good enough at other things to warrant a spot on the roster? Then there's Darian Travis, who is a pretty good coverage linebacker with 84 speed, and we'll see if he can provide any sort of impact. Now here is a look at the depth chart heading into preseason. There is a lot of competition. We have competition at wide receiver, left guard, right tackle, and quarterback. Once again, Blake Bortles versus Nataki Mason with a starting quarterback job on the line. Defensively, we still have to sort out the secondary. Who is going to start opposite of Nate Bell? I'll tell you the two rookies are going to get a chance, and Michael Bryan's going to get a chance. We have to find a guy to play free safety, nickel corner, and right cornerback. At special teams, we have a punter competition. Brian Anger versus an undrafted player, Max Broussard. And then Tavon Austin will handle return duties. Now before we wrap this up, I wanted to show you guys the only superstar development player that I drafted this year. I took four back in Season 1. This year it's Antoine Dunn who also has clutch already. I'm excited to see if Antoine Dunn can live up to his hashtag Dunn deal that was created in the chat when I drafted him. Here is Josh Buchanan. He did not have anything all that special in terms of traits. Keiston Holiday could still use some work here. He's also normal development and has fight for yards at least. Here is Gordon Solomon who has quick development, an aggressive player when the ball is in the air along with Nate Bell, and we'll see if Gordon Solomon can become the right cornerback. The preseason schedule has us facing the Bengals, Bills, Browns, and Broncos, and then the regular season schedule is also here, and we start off by facing the Baltimore Ravens and then the Tennessee Titans. We play the Titans again, both times very early in the season. Then we have a week seven bye. We face the entire AFC North, by the way, along with the NFC West. And we close the season not against a division rival, but the Seattle Seahawks instead. So there you have it, guys. That is the offseason for Season 2 in the Jacksonville Jaguars franchise. Up next, I'll have the preseason along with the highlight video. Those two videos are on the way. And then we'll get into Season 3 and see how these Jaguars perform in the third year of the Jacksonville Jaguars franchise. Thank you all for watching. Please leave any feedback you have on the offseason down below in the comment section. Subscribe for the next season of the Jaguars franchise, and I will see you guys next time. Have a great day.